Hey, it's Brian Bunce, Pharma Editor at Drug Discovery and Development and Pharmaceutical Processing World. I'd like to welcome you to our first podcast of the year and open up this year's Pharma 50. I recently got a chance to sit down with Fabian Gerlinghaus, the CEO of Solaris, a cell therapy manufacturing company. In this interview, Fabian details his cell therapy journey and Solaris' mission. Fabian covers the challenges in cell therapy manufacturing and how to overcome them, benchmarks, achievements, and much more. I hope you enjoy our discussion. So maybe you can give me a rundown of what led you to initially co-found the company when you guys got launched. Yeah, happy to, Brian. I, just before starting Solaris, I was the chief innovation officer at Syntego, running a research department there. Part of my role entailed doing a lot of market research and attending a lot of conferences that covered both the traditional world of biologics as well as cell therapies. And during that time, I ultimately stumbled across the challenges in cell therapy manufacturing and the opportunity here. If you listened at the, any of these conferences, people were shouting from the rooftops, we need cell therapy manufacturing technologies that are fully automated, fully closed and, and scalable to actually be able to produce these life-saving therapeutics at large scale for all the patients who need them. And then on a related note, maybe you can give me a brief kind of overview of the traditional hurdles of cell therapy and how the company is working to overcome those hurdles. Yeah, happy to. So cell therapy manufacturers today have difficulty meeting the demand of the patients for their cell therapies due to the lack of automated, high-throughput manufacturing technologies. So the way cell therapies are manufactured today is with teams of highly trained professionals spending weeks in very expensive clean rooms, executing on, on the order of 50 manual processing steps on a plethora of benchtop instruments that handle one unit operation for one patient at a time. So these benchtop instruments that handle one unit operation for one patient at a time provide pharma companies with the flexibility to run the cell therapy process that actually defines and makes up their product, their cell therapy products. Um, but they also lock them into a manufacturing paradigm that is very failure prone. So we're seeing process failure rates of up to 18% in the cases of some cell therapy companies. And these cell therapies are very expensive to produce, as everyone in the industry knows. And it's very difficult to scale out to meet commercial scale patient demand with these manual manufacturing methods. Well, on that note, maybe you could talk a little more about some of the accessibility and quality of cell and gene therapy issues you've seen over the, the past recent year or so. Yeah, I would say overall last year, 2021, has been an incredible year for, cell, for the cell therapy industry. We've seen a number of new indications and products uh, reach FDA approval, um, as well as uh, existing cell therapy products being approved for new indications, Takarta, Sabecma, Yuskarta, Brianzi, to name just a few. That said, while the industry is charging ahead and we're seeing all of this progress on the science side, when it comes to manufacturing, the accessibility challenges still remain. It's still very expensive to make cell therapies. It's still very difficult to make cell therapies at the scale of tens of thousands of patients per year. And when we're talking about quality, you know, I just mentioned some cell therapy companies are reporting process failure rates up to 18%. So the problem really hasn't changed. The challenge is how do we close the cell therapy manufacturing process to avoid the contamination? How do we fully automate the cell therapy manufacturing to avoid the risk of an operator error in all of these manual processing steps? Those two challenges remain if we are to address the challenges with the quality of uh, the reproducibility as well as the scalability and the cost effectiveness of manufacturing these life-saving therapeutics. The cell shuttle seems very unique. Is there anything... Maybe you can talk about how you position kind of like the social the marketplace. Is anybody else doing anything you really like it? I don't think so. I'd say one of the most differentiating factors of the cell shuttle is that it actually automates not just one of the unit operations, but all unit operations. So we're automating the entire cell therapy manufacturing process from start to finish. And the cell shuttle does this not just for one manufacturing process at a time, but for 10 manufacturing processes simultaneously. So the combination of a manufacturing platform that provides end-to-end -end automation with an order of magnitude improvement in instrument throughput is what makes that scalable platform that pharma companies can use to actually meet 
commercial scale patient demand in the tens of thousands of patients per year per drug in a cost efficient and robust manner. Robust meaning low failure rates, low process failure rates. So that's the primary differentiating factor. And then the automation and really high throughput makes us a scalable platform. And the other big differentiating factor is flexibility. It's important to recognize that every cell type of manufacturing process with each of these companies is slightly different when it comes to the details. And if you're to solve the, the problem of scalable, cost-efficient, robust cell therapy manufacturing, not just for that one pharma company, but for the entire industry, it is absolutely critical to build a cell therapy manufacturing platform that has the flexibility to support a wide variety of cell therapy modalities. And that's what we're doing with the cell shuttle. Cell shuttle basically supports every cell therapy manufacturing process based on suspension cells. So that's CAR-Ts, TCRs, FKs, HSCs. And we're also addressing both autologous as well as allogeneic workflows. So that was what a lot of the key innovations that went into the design of this platform really were were geared towards addressing this challenge. How do you build a platform that is not just scalable, automated, cost-efficient, but also offers sufficient flexibility and modularity to pharma companies to actually run the cell cycle manufacturing process that defines their product? We chatted last year briefly about the Early Access Partnership Program. I was wondering if you could tell me briefly kind of what the idea was behind the program and what the status is today, how many companies have joined. The idea behind the Early Access Partnership Program was to achieve product market fit. So we recognize that we're taking on a lot in terms of scope. We're building a very complex piece of technology. And the way to get it right is to work collaboratively with your future customers really early on in the process. So to date, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, Poseida, Pax Pharma, and one additional undisclosed pharma company that we've not been public about have all joined and participated in the Early Access Partnership Program. And the goal here, as I mentioned, was to achieve product market fit. So what we did with our partners was they shared with us detailed documentation of their cell therapy manufacturing workflows down to every critical quality attribute in unit operation. And having this information put our scientists and engineers into the position where they knew exactly what they had to build and which requirements the cell shuttle had to meet to be a viable cell type of manufacturing solution for a wide variety of different processes and cell type of modalities. So this goal has effectively been achieved, and at this point, the Early Access Partnership Program is complete. We're no longer recruiting additional partners for this program because the window of opportunity to actually influence what exactly we're building has effectively closed, and the goal of ensuring product market fit has been achieved. I think those are the questions I had, but I have one last one if you are game for it. It's a fairly straightforward question. So. Um, Biggest achievements of 2021. So I saw that you won the Life Sciences Catalyst Award. Um, you named Ezekiel Emanuel to your board of advisors. It seems like it was a big year. Maybe you could just kind of talk about some of the achievements from 2021. Winning an award, I'm, I'm feeling very honored by that. We're incredibly lucky to have Zeke Emanuel on the board of advisors. We've made tremendous progress on the technology development front. So lots of progress there, but not quite ready to be public about that. And we've grown the company significantly. Where this time a year ago, we were about 30 people. Right now, we're 100 people. So we've effectively tripled the size of the company since this time last year. So lots and lots of growth. And more to come. So let's chat again in the future, Brian. It sounds good. Well, good catching up with you. And it's cool hearing about the progress and about the tripling of your team in the past year. And they kind of like the vision for the company and your progress so far. So appreciate your time. Good catching up and we'll have to chat again in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. I'd like to thank Fabian Gerlinghouse for walking us through his cell therapy journey and opening up our Pharma 50 Talks podcast. Check out our next episode as I get a chance to speak with the CMO of Carius, Brad Perkins. And be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to Drug Discovery and Development on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. We'll have more for you as we continue on with this year's Pharma 50. Until next time.